It's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Hong Bo Chi from uh, St. Saint, Saint Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. Um, I thought I was slick by taking over the seminar series at LJI so that I could invite people to invite scientists that I admire without running it by anybody else. But once word got out, Hongbo was coming, the whole Mesa kind of got involved. So, so it became a collaborative, uh, a collaborative seminar this time. So we're really excited to have him. Um, I'm going to keep it short, but um, some, of the some of the honors that uh, Hongbo's had just in the last couple of years is uh, he's, he's been uh, awarded the Outstanding, uh, Outstanding Research Award. Um, he's got an NIAID Merit Award. Um, he's been he's been referred to as uh, one of the highly most highly cited scientists in 2020 and 2021. And so I looked up his H index, which is 53, on two different websites. And in, in for relative, I'm not even listed on the website. So um, you can tell he's it's, this is going to be a fantastic talk, and I'm really looking forward to it. So with no further ado, Pablo. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for the kind introduction. I'm very honored also to be invited by both Sam and Michael. And actually, actually I have to, have to brag about it. Angela invited me a couple of years ago for the LGI talk. I gave it virtually. So I'm uh, so excited to be here in person and see Ananda's face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The last standing interest of my group is to study immunometabolism, especially how the uh, immune signaling cross talk with metabolic program and how they regulate immune responses and in particular T cell mediated diseases. That's why for today's discussion I'd like to be focusing on work in T cell metabolism and also the implication in immune oncology. To study the interplay between immune signaling and metabolism, we are interested in several kinase pathway, especially mTOR. And we also explore how this kinase pathway cross talk with the cell metabolic programs, including uh, bioenergetics, such as glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, cell biosynthetic activity. And uh, more recently, we are exploring how nutrient and the metabolite can serve as signaling role to regulate immune responses. So therefore, given this extensive cross talk between signaling and the metabolism, we consider this as a two-way street or bidirectional metabolic signaling. And within that underlying theme, we explore both T cell metabolism as well as how T cell immunity is cross-regulated by metabolism of antidepressant cells, the nutrient cells. And for today's discussion, I'll usually be uh, entirely focusing our work on T cell metabolism. And first, I'd like to give some introduction to our work in actually integrating system immunology with T cell metabolism. And then I'll be uh, focusing on work in uh, TRAP biology. So it's going to be uh, uh, two uh, topics. Metabolism, as we know, is a fundamental requirement of all living cells. But in cells simply serving as housekeeping function or this essential role of cell growth, the metabolic activity is a very active and dynamic, dynamically regulated process. For instance, for high, uh, highly proliferating cells such as cancer cells, they will upregulate glycolysis even in the presence of abundant oxygen. This is known as aerobic glycolysis or the Weber effect. For activated T cells, partly because they are massive rate of proliferation, so they will upregulate glycolysis. Not a surprise. However, what was surprising was a collaboration with Doug Green actually a few years ago when, when we found that the cell galactic activity, the T cell galactic activity is much highly upregulated when T cells develop into effector cells, including T1, T2, T17 cells, versus their di differentiation into induced T-Rex cells. And we further show this stronger galactic activity for effector cells, especially T17 cells, is important to support this uh, cell fate differentiation process. Uh, over the past uh, few years, many metabolic programs have been identified in T cells. As a matter of fact, T cells, each step of the development or activation of function requires active reprogramming of their metabolism, starting from thymic development to peripheral activation and then differentiation into a factor regulatory or uh, memory cells. 
Moreover, recent study highlights the importance of metabolic reprogramming for TSA-mediated diseases, including infection, actually including the COVID-19 infection, the immune response towards uh, COVID-19 infection, um, actually SARS-CoV-2, as well as many autoimmune diseases. These are mediated by the um, unique metabolic programs, the nutrient transporters, and also the driver genes uh, that's associated with the TSA activation and the differentiation state. In the case of highly immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, it is often metabolic challenging. For instance, T cell function and metabolism are often limited by the nutrient signals available to them, including the mechanism of nutrient partitioning. This is the, how the nutrients are distributed among different cells in the tumor microenvironment, nutrient deprivation, and also build up the toxic nutrient and metabolic products. And the last panel showed the uh, regulation of the inhibitor pathway uh, inside the cells. So therefore, for effective, effective T-cell therapy, we need to restore and promote the metabolic fitness of T-cells. Given this consideration, then what are the important players of the metabolic pathway in T-cells? So in this uh, recent review in Nature Review Immunology, we just highlight several of the uh, well-studied metabolic pathway in T-cells, including glycolysis, glutamine uh, metabolism, mitochondrial metabolism, and also the uh, lipid metabolism. And we describe how this metabolic program can be shaped by the immune, immunology signal, the T-cell receptor, co-stimulation, and cytokine signaling, the signals one, two, and three. At the same time, we also start to appreciate the importance of the nutrient in the microenvironment, such as glucose, amino acid, or minerals, and how this nutrient can impact the T-cell metabolic program, and also signal transduction pathway is really emerging area of interest. So therefore, we like to call them collectively as signal four to regulate T-cell immunity. And among the central regulators of all, many of these metabolic processes is a kinase known as mTOR. mTOR serves as a uh, central regulator of, of cell metabolism and cell growth, and which functions through one of the two kinase complexes, mTOR1 and mTOR2. A unique feature of mTOR signaling is its ability to integrate signal from either outside the cell, such as immunology signals, growth factor and nutrient, or many times it reflects the cell intracellular metabolic state. And we are very interested in how M2 and other metabolic pathway can regulate T cell responses. And from this perspective, we study both the conventional T cell activation and differentiation, and as well as the TREC biology. What we'd like to draw this simple you know, metabolic uh, diagram with these simple cartoons or this many of these linear areas, we know in reality, the intracellular metabolic network is an incredibly complicated process. For instance, the metabolome is much more complex than the protein or transcriptome. It's more difficult to measure in general, and also it's very dynamic, dynamic as it frequently involves metabolic feedback, feed forward, adaptation and crosstalk processes. Partly because of this huge complexity, we believe a system level understanding and system level uh, investigation is critical to study immunometabolism and also immune-mediated diseases. And system immunology refers to the use of omics and large data large scale data set to understand immune system function and the un underlying mechanism of course, involve deep, uh, deep profiling at a different level, at the population level or single cell level. But more importantly, it is the data integration that's crucial to gain biological insight and disease target. So from that perspective, let me just share with you some of the uh, system tools we use in our toolbox. This include the uh, hidden driver analysis, which is in collaboration with Yang Yuan Institute, 
So the idea is many of the important driver genes, they may not be regulated at mRNA or protein expression level. However, if they're important, their, their protein activity should be reflected by the target gene they, that are regulated by them. So therefore, by profiling the target gene expression, then we use a competition program to predict the driver molecule. So therefore, we call them hidden driver analysis. Also, in collaboration with the Jimmy Plus Institute, we extensively apply proteomics uh, profiling. So this goes with total protein, fossil protein, as well as the protein-protein interaction of PPI network analysis. And also, more recently, we actually heavily apply in vivo CRISPR screening as a way to identify the uh, new driver and the new target in immunometabolism. And in the next few slides, let me just share with you our, give you some examples of these three different system tools. The first one, as I mentioned, is hidden driver analysis. And here, to, in order to identify this hidden driver, basically uh, based on the protein activity, we apply the uh, transcriptome, whole protein, and fossil protein profiling. And then we also reverse engineering this network that reflect the driver and also target gene expression. So therefore, by profiling those target gene expression, then, and also integration with this network, now we're able to predict the driver molecule that's important for immune responses, uh, also for immunometabolism. And more recently, we applied this network approach to single cell uh, data sets, including single cell uh, RNA sequencing and single cell ATAC-seq which help us to build intracellular drivers as well as the intercellular, the cell-cell interaction driver, uh, driver molecules. The second system approach we apply is system proteomics. This is in collaboration with the Jimmy Peng group. We did this one of the first proteomic profiling of naive T cells activated at a different time point of following T cell uh, receptor stimulation. So altogether, we're able to capture uh, almost like uh, 10,000 proteins and also over 10,000 fossil proteins. So in a way, we can, this is also equivalent to doing like 10,000 Western blot in one shot. And having obtained such data, then we also developed a network approach to integrate this data, try to get a sense of the biological process underlying, uh, which allow us to identify the reprogramming of mitochondria as important to support T cell exit from the quiescent state. So therefore, as the beginning I mentioned, T cell will operate like glycolysis upon uh, antigen stimulation. But here we also show the mitochondria uh, metabolism is also critical to support that process. So part of the beauty upon this proteomic profiling, we propose six hallmarks to drive T cell exit from quiescence. This is the, uh, include the, uh, this includes the cell growth, uh, so cell cycle entry, cytokine signaling, anabolic metabolism, nutrient uptake, and also reprogramming of mitochondrial function. And we also highlight that the M2 and CMYK serve as a central hub to coordinate these signals, this metabolic, intracellular metabolic signal with the, uh, the immune and uh, the metabolic cues the T cell will receive. Moreover, we can apply this metabolic quiescence and metabolic activation principle to different immunological contexts, including tier 17 cell. We show that tier 17 cells are metabolic heterogeneous. They include like a TCL1 positive, like stem-like subset or homostatic subset, and a more terminal differentiated type one uh, T-cell-like uh, mature cells. It's more pathogenic. So therefore, the, these two subsets can be defined by their unique metabolic programs. That's why we call them metabolic heterogeneity for tier 17 responses. The third system approach we use, which actually became our favorite, is in vivo CRISPR screening. So let me just use one of our first example to show the ideas behind. Here we are interested in uh, the, how the metabolic drivers can modulate T cell immunity. So in a way, we are searching for the negative regulatory molecule that when T 
target in T cell will drive or boost T cell immunity towards tumor. So therefore, we build this metabolic library that target over 3,000 known or putative metabolic regulators. Then we'll transduce this library into tumor specific T cell and followed by parking those T cell onto tumor bearing mice. And one week later, we ask those T cells to compete, then trying to find the, uh, uh, the winners. And this allows us to identify recognition one as the very top hit. That's in the absence of recognition one, there's massive uh, accumulation of T cell in the tumor microenvironment. And this also shows much better anti tumor immunity. I appreci appreciate actually. Uh, uh, Ananda and uh, Miguel's uh, news and view to highlight the importance of Ragnis One and also the program regulated by Ragnis One to uh, uh, regulate, I mean, to uh, affect under tumor immunity. But having identified Ragnis One at the top inhibitory pathway for under uh, tumor immunity, then we look for the target gene by which Ragnis One can function. And Ragnis-1 itself is an enzyme that we degrade MRA. There's uh, thousands of targets. So therefore, it's very hard to identify the right target. So here, again, the CRISPR screening is highly powerful in that we did this genetic in vivo rescue CRISPR screening by co-transducing T cells with Ragnis-1 guard RNA together with the genome-wide uh, library. And we'll look for the guard, the guard RNA then can rescue the Ragnis-1 knockout cell phenotype. This allows us to identify BATF as a crucial target that function in the, uh, uh, to drive the Ragnis-1 knockout phenotype in terms of the uh, boosting uh, T cell killing activity. At the same time, we also identify TCF1 as another K target uh, affected by Ragnis-1. So therefore, in the absence of Ragnis-1, both BTF and the TCF1 expression gets upregulated, then we can uh, boost, boost t uh, both T cell kidney activity as well as their long term persistence. This is part of the reason we believe that can explain why the Ragnis 1 knockout T cells are highly effective in killing tumor. So, more recently, we are trying to move this into uh, hopefully into early phase clinical trial uh, in collaboration with many Sinju investigators. We developed this GMP grade guard RNA targeting Ragnis 1 in human T cells and then in human CAR T cells as a way to, to treat BLL, the leukemia, for uh, that affects a, a large number of pediatric uh, patients. So, in this principal study, uh, we trans transfer the tumor cell, the human tumor cell, into the NFC mouse model then followed by the transfer of either Ragnis-1 Y-type or Ragnis-1 knockout CAR-T cells. As you can see, compared with the Ragnis-1 Y-type CAR-T cells, those lacking Ragnis-1, the Ragnis-1 knockout CAR-T shows much better uh, therapeutic effect. And overall, we're quite excited about this project as it shows an example of truly unbiased discovery of a novel target to shape uh, cancer immunotherapy and also is this project establish a clear path to clinical translation. What did the survival curve look like? Uh -huh. I skip it, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite, quite good. It's not 100%, but it's, it's, it's quite, uh, I think, quite good. I mean, at least in the molecule we knock out, that's the best one we, we got so far. Now for the rest of uh, like 15 minutes, let me share with you some of the uh, unpublished study. Now we apply the similar actually CRISPR screening and we screen for epigenetic factor. Part of, of the reason is the epigenetic pathway will cross, constantly cross talk with the metabolic pathway. And part of the reason actually this is a really nice collaboration with Doug Green, uh, who actually I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, knows Doug's name, who used to be actually at LGI. So here we use the uh, CRISPR screening to try to find the uh, epigenetic factor that in this is knockout will boost the T cell memory. Uh, here we use actually listeria over infection, very simple infection model, partly because we can underlie, uh, analyze T cell responses like after one month of uh, listeria infection. We can isolate different T factor 
uh, terminal effect cells or memory precursors, but also we can compare the T cell enrichment at the later stage with the early stage of immune responses. From this epigenetic library, we identify the SWI SNF complex, the, the uh, conventional BATH complex within this SWI SNF big complexes. It's crucial inhibitory pathway for T cell memory. And in the absence of this, those genes, many actually they all belong to the CBAF complex. You can see this stronger T cell memory responses at the expense of effector responses. So this is a comparison of memory phase and also the effector phases of T cell responses. The BAF complex is a part of the SNF complexes. And also, the SWASNIF complex itself has a three uh, different subcomplexes, sub including the conventional BAF complex, the PBAF, and the NCBAF complex. And overall, these are the important chromatin remodeling complex that can affect gene expression in different types of cells. So having identified the CBAF complex as an important uh, regulator of CD T cell memory, then we did the uh, validation experiment. Here, again, this is a quite a routine uh, listeria over-infection. Then we uh, examine the uh, T cell uh, accumulation in different lymph organs. We found that indeed, as we, uh, as the data shown from the CRISPR screening, when we knock out the, uh, either the uh, SMARC CD2 or red one a each of them belong to the CBAF complex, there's more memory T cell generated in different organ examined. And also for this, upon the re-challenge re of the listeria-infected mice, we found that those T cell, those knockout T cell shows better recall response, suggesting that there's better memory uh, form in the absence of those CBAF complex, but also there's better memory function in the absence of the CBAF complex. As for the molecular insight, we noticed that the CMIC actually, this actually which happened to be included in our library, also gets actually is turned out to be a, a important regulator of T cell memory. And Doug Green actually have this really nice insightful paper suggesting how the CMIC, that's their expression, is very important for T cell to make their decision between effector versus the memory cells. In that the cells with higher CMIC expression are prone to become effector cells, while those with actually less make expression turn out to be uh, turn out to be more uh, likely to become memory cells. So therefore, we explore the inter interplay between the CBAF complex and this transcription factor CMIC. And uh, indeed, as I mentioned, the CMIC high cell will contain higher CBAF complex expression. Well, the semi low cell, which turn out to be, those are the cells that are more prone to become memory cells, have less BAF complex expression, suggesting that there's potential interplay between these two pathways, the CMIC and the CBAF. So we went deeper. Actually, many of the study I have said is um, done by uh, Doug Green, uh, all in Doug Green's lab. So what all did here is to further examine whether there's are actually physical interaction between these two factors. This is the common immunoprecipitation Western blood analysis. And indeed, when we uh, all found that when he immunoprecipitated a red one a he can put down CMIC. And conversely, when he immunoprecipitated CMIC, he can put down a red one a suggesting that the physical interaction between these two, uh, two pathways. Moreover, from the transcription factor binding size, there's extensive degree of overlapping binding. In this cut around analysis, is a low input uh, chromatin uh, binding ac uh, ac assay. And the CMIC binding site and red one a or BRG1 binding site shows a great level of overlap. And many of these overlapped uh, binding sites include the gene involved in CMIC, of course, and also, but also the metabolic pathway, including mTOC1, T cell differentiation, and also uh, T cell activation. So therefore, CBAF and CMIC can physically interact with each other, 
and they appear to act in concert to establish the chromatin state. To further explore the functional effect of this interaction, then we made knockout cells, then examine the other factor binding. So basically here we've made the make knockout cells, then examine the c binding. And indeed we found that with the deficiency of c -make, the binding of this c is diminished. This is just a, a control experiment. Of course, with c knockout, c binding is greatly uh, reduced. The reciprocal experiment is to examine the binding of c to the c deficient knockout, uh, to the c deficient cells. So in, uh, for instance, in the red one a knockout, the c binding to selected, selected target, including granzyme B, and the TBAC21 is reduced. So therefore, this data also reveal not only these two factors can uh, interact with each other, there's also reciprocal dependency of them to bind to their respective binding site. Further revealing these two pathways can act in coordination to regulate T cell fate. Finally, we examine the uh, the physiological impact of deleting this, this the uh, CBAF complex for T cell uh, mediated and anti tumor immunity. So here's one, you know, uh, survival curve. And in the absence of SMARC CD2, uh, the tumors, I mean, for the, when we transfer T cell with the deficiency of uh, SMARC CD2, uh, those T cell can control tumor growth better, and the tumor size is reduced, and the survival is modestly improved, I would say. But perhaps the more uh, remarkable finding is a drug inhibitor study. In this CAR-T uh, model, um, we apply the CBAF inhibitor during the CAR-T culture period. Then we transfer those, we wash off the inhibitor and transfer them onto this solid tumor berry mice. So therefore, this is only very transient treatment of this CAR-T cell during the in vitro culture. And what we found is those, those T cells, even with this very transient inhibition of CBAF complex, they show much better persistence in vivo. The T cells express the luciferase, which can be directly monitored in vivo. And consequently, the uh, T cells, the CAR T cells, even with very brief treatment of inhibition of CBAF complex, they show better anti tumor immunity. So, therefore, transient inhibition of CBAF can promote CAR T cell persistence and anti tumor function. To summarize, from the unbiased in vivo CRISPR screening of gen epigenetic factor, we identified CBAF as a critical inhibitor of CD8 memory. We also found that mechanistically, CBAF complex and CMIC, they can interact with each other and also regulate their uh, the reciprocal uh, target for those two pathways. And also, the CBAF appear to be an important target that can be reprogrammed for better uh, better anti-tumor immunity. Um, yes? Done at XC, which gives us a reasonable change. No, we did that. I did not show the data here. There's quite a number of allele, I mean, binding uh, chromatin region are affected by Could actually either of them. Could you relate them to the genes that change expression? I'm sorry? Could you relate them to the genes that change the expression? Yes, yes, right. Many of them, we would do the, uh, actually, sometimes use the Amanda program, right, to coordinate the ataxic data with rna seq data. Many of them are are shared, so. so um, from the, have, have you done the CBAP inhibition study for the memory response? No, we have not. We have not. Like, what, what would you expect if you just right. do a transition mm -hmm. inhibition? Would that affect the long-term memory formation? Right. What we did, I can explain a little bit more detail what we did, time point. We found, actually, the first 48 hours is crucial for the inhibition to work. If we wait, the, like a... 48 hours, then start drug treatment in the CAR-T you know, experiment, it's no longer have an effect. So somehow in that magic window, that's where the CBAC inhibition will uh, be important. I mean, Doug's interpretation, he likes the asymmet asymmetric cell division, but whatever the, you know, the, which model, that model may or may not be, you know, kind of uh, be totally accepted, but I think that time window is certainly crucial. Uh, also, is, uh, this is also the window, that's what I, you know, we call them exit from quiescence, 
because that's really the window with massive protein, you know, epigenetic root programming. So uh, we still don't, yeah. Are you blocking effect, uh, activation? Are you Actually, if activation? Act activation got a little bit reduced, but not much. That's why. By what criteria? I'm sorry? What are your criteria for activation not being reduced much? Uh, cell number. Right, we look, because we, we do the short treatment in vitro, right? We transfer them in vivo. We look for the short term, like after a few days later, looking for T cell number. They reduce, but they very modestly. And what about cytokine expression? A cytokine re uh, expression, actually, we also examine interferon, which interferon is not affected. Yeah, so, I'm I mean, the I'm just curious to see if, if, curious whether you think that some other aspect of activation is suppressed to give you increased memory function. You would expect. Right, we would expect re the uh, activation would be reduced, which we see. I mean, as I, I was said, like cell number reduced a little bit, but later on they will there will be met actually more cells later on. Right. Okay, all right, thank you. So overall the idea to the build upon this uh, screening data, also the target we identify on CRISPR screening, uh, build a better cars, and better cars that can last. So what overall, what have we learned from this part of the discussion from the in vivo CRISPR screening? We believe this is the one of the best way to discover new biology, new driver genes and also new target. And also, I did not have time uh, to show here the uh, extensive discuss it, but this is a very uh, crucial way to identify new mechanism, such as the, the genome-wide rescue, uh, rescue screen we did f to identify the target uh, for uh, Reckoning Swan. And using similar of screening platform, we also use, uh, explore the CD T cell differentiation uh, in different contexts, uh, including identification of the fucose, which is a unique sugar that's important to link to a CD T cell fate decision. That's because it's a way to regulate NASH signaling. And uh, we also identify the uh, phospholipid, known as phosphatidylacetylamine, is important to drive follicular helper T cell differentiation in part by stabilizing uh, CRCR5. So having taste or, ex or experienced such a power of system immunology, so actually at St. Jude we have this blue sky project. This is really uh, only the sky's the limit. Then we propose to use a system immunology approach, especially CRISPR screening and this computational approach, the, uh, to identify new target for uh, pediatric cancer, because St. Jude is a hospital for pediatric cancer. On one hand, we propose use in vivo CRISPR screening in cancer cells or T cell or CAR T cells for the uh, pediatric cancer, including the leukemia, brain tumor, and also solid tumor. And on the other hand, we apply the, the hidden driver analysis it's, and also combine that with single cell profiling, try to build the tumor, tumor in micro environment interaction maps and by explore both the intracellular and the intercellular driver genes. So this is, uh, where the uh, first topic is, uh, is, is about. Then I'd like to switch gears and move on to the second part of the discussion, talking about the nutrient signaling in T-Rex cell. So basically this is a, like a, the dark side of T cell immunity for tumor. T-Rex cells, as we know, are crucial to mediate immune hom homeostasis. But also, but on the other hand, T-Rex are the major barrier one of the major barriers for effective tumor immunity and tumor immunotherapy. So therefore, how to find the balance? Find the balance that can still maintain immune homeostasis, but will disrupt tumor-specific TRAC function has been an important question in the field. Our interest in, in, in this area came from this, actually again, somewhat surprising finding. It's a surprising because M12 was generally considered as a negative inhibitor, I mean, negative regulator for T-Rex cell function. But what we found is when we knock out Raptor or MTOC1 uh, function in T-Rex cells, the mice die from inflammation due to the profound loss of T-Rex cell function. Mechanistically, we propose MTOC1 is important to drive anabolic metabolism, especially the mobility pathway. And then this is important to drive T-Rex cell proliferation and activation. 
uh, having established mTOR1 as a critical positive determinant of T-Rex function, we next explore the upstream and downstream pathway by which mTOR1 can function. For the, part, uh, for the upstream pathway, we define the two amino acids, in particular the uh, arginine and leucine, are crucial to activate mTOR. And we call this a licensing role because despite the critical importance of T cell receptor to activate mTOR1, it, it is unable to do so in the absence of amino acid. So therefore, we propose the amino acid dependent mTOR1 activation is important to license T cell mTOR1 T cell induced mTOR1 activation. As for the downstream pathway, I mentioned mTOR1 is important for movalent, movalent metabolism. But for the downstream, it's not actually the cholesterol itself, but this isoprenoid appears to be very important in mediating the movalent metabolism in uh, regulating uh, T cell function. This isoprenoid are lipid moiety that can be added onto the target gene a target protein such as the small uh, G protein REC, so uh, through the uh, uh, post-transition modification process known as protein pregnation. This includes a protein finesselation and also general granulation. Basically, it's a unique PTM um, uh, mode of regulation. And over the years, we made actually many FOXB3 CRE uh, dependent deletion of raptor and many other mTOR and also metabolic pathway. And in each case, like each of this knockout we listed here, we can kill the mice uh, by inducing the profound loss of T-Rex cell function. Well, these data are um, analyzed as show the importance of this metabolic pathway in programming T-Rex cell function. This, this pathway clearly should not be targeted for, uh, tumor, uh, for tumor therapy. So therefore, we have been also searching for the pathway that can mediate TREC function in a tumor-specific manner. And indeed, recently we found the, uh, the de novo lipid synthesis appear to be one of those pathways that can function in a tumor TREC specific manner. Some in the lab, a talented fellow in the lab, she found that when she knocked out SCAP, which is an important adapter molecule for this group of transcription factor known as SIBP, when she knocks out SCAP in T-Rex cells, those mice are completely fine. They don't develop autoimmunity, but those mice can clear tumor in a much better way compared with white mice. And similarly, when she knocks out the fatty acid synthase, this which mediate fatty acid, uh, de novo fatty acid synthase, again, those mice with T-Rex specific knockout of fasin are completely normal, at least the way we look at it. No autoimmunity, but again, those, those mice will clear tumor in a much better way compared with white mice. So therefore, we propose the lipid signaling in T-Rex cells is important for functional specialization of T-Rex cells in tumors. This is partly by, uh, is to keep interferon, uh, interferon, interferon uh, gamma production in check. In other words, when we knock out SCAP, the interferon gamma gets excessively produced by T-Rex cells, which is uh, detrimental to T-Rex function in the tumor. So altogether, we are quite interested in ex further exploring how lipid signaling and lipid metabolism can regulate T-cell function, including the lipid synthesis, the movalent metabolism, as well as the lipid uh, catabolic processes. Yes? But when you knock out SCAP, you also inhibit SRGP2. Yeah, so this is kind of a kind of a equivalent to double knockoff for SRBP1 and SRBP2. Yeah, yeah, so, but on your slide, you say it's mediated through DNL, not through, through the metabolomic path. Right, actually both. There are two branches. Okay. One is regulating the fatty acid synthesis. The other one is mobile metabolism. Actually, both lipid-related pathways so are right. Both fatty acids and cholesterol Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We haven't been able to actually distinguish SRPP1 versus 2 function. Okay. Um, and also, they actually downstream, they go through different mechanisms, but both seem to be important uh, for TREC function in the tumor context. 
So now we can add the uh, lipid signaling, including SCAP and SIPP, of fatty acid synthase on the right side of the equation. So those, because they appear to be tumor TREC specific regulator, but then those knockout will not affect the systemic immune homeostasis. Uh, having applied this reverse genetic or this condition knockout approach for actually for the last 10 years, we got, in, especially in T-Rex, uh, we got a little bit exhausted. That's why we try to use more system approach, try to reconstruct the entire signal network by which neutron can signal. So that's why, that's when we started the uh, CRISPR screening project by Ling Yun Long, a very talented fellow. Um, trying to use in vivo, I'm uh, sorry, the genome-wide screening in vitro, try to capture all the important regulator that can deliver signal from T cell receptor and neutron down to mtoc one activation. And here the idea is he transduced the genome-wide library um, into the uh, induced T-Rex cells and followed by the stimulation of this uh, T-Rex cell with T cell receptor stimulation together with the amino the, uh, the uh, uh, nutrient. And here the nice part of it is that for AMTO activation, there's very uh, nice antibody for phosphorylation of S6. So therefore we can sort S6 high versus S6, phosphor S6 high and low cells, which be a surrogate marker for AMTOC1 high and AMTOC1 low cells. This allow us to identify the, um, the molecular, the molecule is important to either enhance or inhibit mTOC1 activity. Here, actually, indeed, we can rediscover many of the known regulator, um, including the uh, mTOR raptor, all this molecule as an uh, important part of regulator of mTOC1 in t uh, Rex cells, and also many of the known regulator for uh, mTOC1. As a matter of fact, in total, we identified like three or 400 molecules that can be uh, actually meet the cutoff suggesting they are either positive or negative regulator of mTOR. Since this is a genome-wide library screening, then we also to further validate this data, we did a secondary CRISPR screening by building upon secondary library. It's a smaller, much smaller library that only contains those positive hit from the primary screening. And in this secondary screening, we can again rediscover many of the known regulator of mTOC1. As a matter of fact, by comparing the first primary and secondary screening, 80% of the hit are shared between the two screens, suggesting this is a very highly robust and reproducible screening platform. But we do have a problem, and that is we simply have too many hits. It's very hard to prioritize which molecule we should focus on. So therefore, this is our previous expertise by working with Jimmy Peng Group for the proteomics and also especially for the protein-protein interaction of PPR network uh, became important. Here with the PPR network, now we can sort those different re uh, purity regulator into different beings, including the epigenetic regulator, transcriptional or uh, the transitional machinery. And also we noticed this also a complex known as Gator, Gator 1 and Gator 2 that's also important and be uh, discovered in T cells. And Gator 1 and Gator 2 was the initial work from David Sabatini. Uh, they identified that Gator 1 as a natural regulator of mTOC1, while Gator 2 is part of regulator by inhibiting the inhibitors. We successfully, we success, successfully capture both complexes in our T cell screening. In addition, we also identify SEC31A, which is molecule has not been implicated in mTOR regulation, we found that SEC31A co-segregate into the uh, gator complex. So therefore, we focus on SEC31A as well as the important target of purity party regulator of mTOR1. Here in this data validation experiment, we knock out SEC31A in T-Rex cells, induced T-Rex cells, then stimulate them with amino acid or glucose as compared with white type cells with, which will upregulate S6K or S6 phosphorylation, the SEC31A knockout cell has reduced ability to upregulate this uh, mtoc one signature uh, phosphorylation events. Another uh, event that 
and uh, that's induced by mTOR1 activation is mTOR translocation to the lysosome in an amino acid dependent manner. And we found that in T cell, this is also true. With amino acid stimulation, mTOR will translocate into the lysosome surface, but in the absence of SAC31A, this tran translocation is nearly ab abolished. So suggesting that SAC31A is indeed required for nutrient-dependent mTOR1 activation. So what about molecular mechanism? As I alluded to, that SAC31 can co-segregate into the gator complex in our PPI network analysis. And indeed, we found these two proteins can indeed intact. In a way, SAC31A, we found, can intact, especially with SAC13. This is one of the unique components of Gator2. When we immunoprecipitate SAC31A, we can pull down SAC13. Uh, the reciprocal experiment also is true, although I did not show here. So judging there's interaction between the SAC31A, this new molecule we discovered, and <coughs> SAC13. Moreover, with absence of SAC31A, we found SAC13 abundance is diminished in this Western blood analysis. <coughs> but this diminished SAC13 expression can be blocked when we use MG132 to block ubiquitin-mediated proteinsomal degradation. So therefore, SAC31A intact with SAC13 and promotes SAC13 stability. In data now shown here, we also found that SAC13 indeed can be uh, can involve the ubiquitination of this molecule. So this allows us to focus on SAC13 as an important um, mediator of uh, Gator2, and in a way that is SAC13 itself is regulated by SAC31A. So that's the model and the hypothesis we are testing. To test this, we uh, first measure SAC13 protein degradation with cyclohexima treatment to block new protein synthesis, and you can see the SAC13 gets degraded. degraded, degraded. Um, this actually measurement of the half-life of SAC13, and uh, with SAC31 in knockout, the half-life is shortened. So that indeed, SAC31 can promote the protein stability of SAC13. SAC13 has a total of 16 lysine residues. We next explored how is SAC13 regulated by the protein somal degradation and also polyubiquitination process? So in a way, we did a site immunogenesis to mutate each of the 16 lysine residue to arginine for SAC13. And we found that only when we mutate lysine 260, either alone or in combination with the neighboring lysine, we can remarkably boost SAC13 expression level. Moreover, when we make this mutant SAC13, we found the SAC31 is no longer functional. As you can tell here, with the uh, mut mutation of lysine 260 of SAC13, its, it's the protein stability gets much better. But moreover, when we mutate SAC31A, we delete SAC31A, the SAC13 uh, uh, stability is not affected at all. So altogether, we conclude that the lysine 260 of SAC13 is important for its uh, stability in a SAC31A dependent manner. Then finally, we went for the ubiquitin and also E3 ligase involved in degrading SAC13. Once again here, the PPI network and collaboration with human pung is important, and we use the immunoprecipitation followed by mass spec analysis to look for SAC13 binding partner, which reviewed actually SKP1 as one of the top hit. SKP1 is, is not E3 ligase itself, but it's a adapter molecule for group of E3 ligase. And we found this from the, uh, this intact analysis, we identified SKP1, and also in the individual validation experiment, we found those two proteins, SAC13 and K SKP1, indeed can interact with each other, which can be controlled by SAC31A. And moreover, I just can summarize data when we made a double knockout of SAC31A and SKP1. Now we can rescue SAC31 knockout phenotype. In that, we can restore SAC13 expression. We can also restore mTOC1 activity. 
So therefore, this data review, the SKP1 uh, containing E3 ligase as an important mediator of SEC13 degradation. To summarize, uh, from the integration of CRISPR screening and PPR network, we identify SEC31A as the party regulator of mTOC1, and mechanistically this uh, uh, involves the interaction with the GATA2 component SEC13, and also the interplay with the uh, SKP1-dependent proteasomal degradation system. See, in the next couple, uh, couple minutes, let me just quickly summarize the uh, uh, so let me just quickly summarize our data on the uh, negative regulator side. Because SEC30, uh, sorry, SEC31A is a party regulator of mTOC1, but we're also interested in the negative regulator of mTOC1, which turned out, one of the negative regulator turned out to be the SAGA complex. We're interested in this process because we, uh, several years ago, we proposed this, Good, this Goldilocks principle for mTOC1 uh, function in T-Rex cells in that either too much mTOC1 activity or too little is detrimental to T-Rex function. So here we have the opportunity to identify a negative regulator of mTOC1 and then in this, in those uh, molecules absence, then we can boost mTOC1 activity. We'd like to see the effect on the T-Rex function uh, in vivo. So uh, cut long story short, we identify CCTC11, which is the component for SACA complex, which is actually another chromatin remodeling uh, complex as an important nectar regulator of mTOC1. In this knockout, we found the mTOC1 activity gets elevated in response to either glucose or amino acid stimulation. And also mechanistically, this is the associated with the excessive or aberrant expression of uh, amino acid and the glucose transporters. In that, the, in the absence of ccd 11 the GLUT1 expression as well as several amino acid transporter gets upregulated. And we did the double knockout by knocking out GLUT1 in ccd 11 knockout cells, we can partly block this excessive mTOC1 activity. And also in vivo, to study the molecular, uh, to study the in vivo function of ccd 11 in t cell, we generated 43 uh, specific deletion of CCTC11. We found that consistent with our in vitro data, mTOC1 activity gets up, 43 gets destabilized. Then the, uh, with the t knockout CCTC11, effective T cell gets out of control, and the mice develop systemic autoimmunity, altogether highlighting the importance of the inhibition of mTOC1 by CCTC11. So altogether, by integrating the CRISPR screening with the PPR network, we identify a new driver for mTOC1 activity, that's SAC31 dependent protection of the GATA2 complex from protein somal degradation. We also identify the com SACA complex as an important regulator of nutrient transporter expression, including both glucose and amino acid transporters. Indeed, now shown here, we also uh, show the important actual, again, CBAF complex as an important regulator of nutrient sensors, such as Castor 1. So altogether, we propose this three-tier regulation that can explain how the nutrient can be transported into T cells, how they're sensed by the sensors, and also how they can mediate signal transduction process. So this will conclude today's discussion on T-cell metabolism and also uh, moving forward, we're quite excited to uh, continue to use, apply the system approaches, including its functional genomics, the proteomics, the PBR network, and with the hope to identify new target and new driver molecule that's important for T-cell mediated diseases. With that, I would like to acknowledge my group uh, including Sun and Ling Yun for their contribution to the SCAP project and also the nutrient uh, signaling project. Hong Ling, who uh, worked with Doug Green's group on the uh, CBAF complex. And also very grateful for many of my collaborators. Uh, really fun to uh, work on, you know, really to extend beyond the traditional immunology study into the new space of uh, system immunology. 
And also, uh, really, I uh, appreciate the uh, support and collaboration with Ananda. So thank you so much for your time. Happy to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> Michael. So what's so special about T-Rex that they depend on mTOR signaling and TH1s don't? Uh, TH1 also, don't, also require uh, mTOR1. Right. So I think mTOR1 is important for both T-Rex cells and the conventional T cells. Um, T-Rex cells likely require, at, at least under that state, require a little bit more of mTOR1 because they are more activity in vivo. They have constant, for instance, the un self antigen recognition and the interleukin-2 signaling. So they have a higher metabolic state under steady state. So they have actually stronger mTOR1 compared with conventional cell, but actually they both require mTOR1. So they have uh, higher bioenergetic demands? T-Rex cells? Yeah. Compared, I mean, this really depends on how, which cell you compare T-Rex with. If you compare naive T-cell with T-Rex, yes, they have higher no, no, uh, metabolic I'm state. No, about activated cells versus T-Rex. So right. T-Rex mm -hmm. all the time monitor. Right, Ex mm -hmm. right. And if you compare activated T cell with T Rex cell, this really is is kind of a more or less equivalent, right? Okay. It's that's why the way I look at it, I'm talking one. It's not necessarily it's a lineage thing, but more about their activation state, right? Lineage between T Rex or non T Rex, but it's I think it's more about their activation state. Right? Mitch and uh, Li Fan, you guys can compete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another T Rex question. Uh -huh. you reported Uh -huh. environment, what subsets of T-Rex, right. is it a hypoxic environment or something else? Yeah. What are your thoughts about Okay, great, great, thank you. I'm waiting for that question to be, <laughs> to be asked. So I don't, we don't have a definitive answer, but we think the model is actually, which we favor the model is, this involves the tumor marking environment that has, is rich in lipid. Ah. In a way, tumor marking environment are, has like a nutrient deprivation with glucose or amino acid, glutamine included but they're rich, in, uh, they're rich in lipid. So therefore, when we knock out scab in T-Rex cells, in the tumor, they can still uptake lipid, right? So in a way, the way we look at it, there's two pathways, de novo synthesis of lipid and uptake of lipid. We block de novo synthesis. T-Rex cells actually still can, are still alive, it's still per actually they have the normal number in the tumor. We think that by, this is, they do this by uptaking the lipid from the tumor, but still, this is still, there's a detrimental effect is their function impaired. Mm -hmm. So there, therefore, T-Rex number are still normal, which I did not show the, uh, in the tumor, but their functional capacity is impaired. So that's where, how we can interpret all this data about the tumor specific context. Have you tried those knockouts in any uh, liver inflammation We only tried the EAE model, okay. which looked to be fine. Okay. Uh, but we haven't compared with other contacts. Maybe Ananda can have more insight there. <laughs> Hi, yes. So I, I want to follow up Michael's question, because you, your answer is that it's not more about the lineage, but more about the state of the cell. Right. But when you first do the screening, you are using this kind of in vitro IT rate. Uh -huh, right, right, right. So they all have the tissue activation. Right. Uh, so when you do those screening, you, I assume you ISO P separate buttery positive nexus, or you just use a total cells in a culture, because not all of them are going to be buttery positive. So I, I just don't know whether the, the, mm. the, the thing that you identify okay. here mm. is restricted to buttery positive cells, or is, uh, is right, 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 right. they're in the same state, okay. then it's going to be the same. Okay, great, great point, uh, Lifan. So technically, when we did the screening, we induced very high high expression of FOP3, like 95% pure. We didn't further restore them, because in that case we have to do the, uh, you know, FOP3 uh, reportermize. So we did not do that, but they're very, you know, we're able to reach very high FOP3 uh, positivity. Uh, also, we use the ITRAC cells simply because these cells 
Um, we can grow a lot of them. Also, they have very much better survival compared with, you know, in, in which I'll teach one cells. And also their dynamic range, I guess their induction for mTOR1 is very strong. There's several reasons why we chose ITREX cells, but this, I mean, many of those findings, we can pull out what people publish in fibroblast or cancer cell in T cell. That's why I don't think they're gonna be uh, linear specific. It's more about their activation or the, you know, all the nutrients, you know, present or absence. So based on what you said, if you don't induce 95%, uh -huh. it's more like 50-50, Yeah, even we don't reach 95% pure, I just, of course, I'm a hand even we didn't do that experiment, I don't think it matters much, right. So hey. It, it, hi. Oh, so it's a wonderful presentation, I learned a lot. Oh, thank wonderful you. Presentation. So let me rephrase the question. So uh, if you use an mTOR inhibitor, uh -huh. so you have these two effects on your T-Rex, you will reduce their activity, mm -hmm. and at the same time, uh, you will also be reducing the Right, exactly. But, but um, with the new uh, for one specific inhibitor, you can, you can dial down very, very quickly. So do you, do you expect it would be, would be acting both with immunosuppressive or you would have a chance right. to uh -huh. those to be uh, enhancing your response? That's a great point. So in a way, the way I look at it, it's going to affect both cells, right? Conventional T cell and the T rex cells. It's going to be very highly dose dependent. If you give very high dose of rapamycin or mTOR1 inhibitor, you're going to shut down the immunity regardless of, uh, you know, because the conventional T-cell are going to be all impaired. But if you give very low dose, which is actually shown by Raphael Matt, you can actually boost the T-cell immunity, the memory cell generation. So it's, first, it's very highly dose dependent way. And then in that in vivo context, really, you know, how the different cell can contribute to the uh, inhibition it's hard to tell. So actually in that case, we know for sure with done low dose of rapamycin, t rex are still perfectly functional. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the, if anything, they get, like, you have more t rex cells. So that's why so somehow, sometimes, also this is due to the like partial inhibition of mTOR1 by rapamycin. It's only the uh, S6K branches gets inhibited. Right, but now you have a new rapa links. They are very specific. Uh -huh, right, 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 right. Actually, we have ongoing collaboration with Kivan, so we still explore that. Right, but thank you. Kivan Shoka, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you so much for your time.